Today's episode is brought to you by shop.mrcoleonnoir.com. Shop.mrcoleonnoir.com is the place for all of your two-way apparel needs. With designs like I Am The Militia, Keep Texas Tactical, and I Lost All My Guns In A Boating Accident, you can show your two-way pride while looking good doing it, and even converting some folks along the way. So head over to shop.mrcoleonnoir.com and grab your two-way merch today. Welcome to episode three of the Coley on Noir podcast. I like to call today's guest the Takashi 69 of the gun world because he has an incredible ability to court attention and get under people's skin in the most entertaining way possible. Kevin Brittingham is probably one of the most infamous people in the gun industry. Over the years, Kevin and I have developed a friendship and I love talking to him because he really doesn't give a damn what people think about him. There are a lot of people in the industry who don't like Kevin and honestly, I can kind of see why they may not like him. But as for me, I love Kevin. I think he's what the industry needs. He clearly knows his shit, and I think he keeps a lot of gun companies honest. And as you'll see in this episode, he tells it how it is, and I love him for it. Over the next hour and 30 minutes, Kevin and I delve into the world of the honey badger, silencers, the 300 blackout, cars, and him going to jail. So let's get to it. So let's jump right into this. Um, for those who don't know you, who haven't had the pleasure of meeting you or knowing who you are, um, kind of, Kevin, kind of just give a brief introduction of what your background is, a little bit of your history, so forth and so on. Well, I'm Kevin Brittingham. I am currently the founder of Q and the chief marketing officer and innovation officer. Um, my background was in 1994, I started a company called Advanced Armament Corporation. And it was focused primarily on silencers, signature reduction stuff. Uh, eventually made rifles. We developed 300 blackout cartridge. I sold that company in 2009 to the Remington's, Remington Arms Corporation and worked there a couple of years. Um, and I mean, that was the beginning of it. From there, I was in a lawsuit with Remington for a couple of years uh, over unpaid Money's guaranteed in the contract, which I prevailed in, um, was allowed to get back to work and was courted by H and K and SIG and decided to go to SIG. And I was uh, division president there for a couple of years of the silencer, started that program, recruited for their military programs and division. And then started uh, after a couple of years left in with my engineering team, some of them dating all the way back to advanced armament, we started a new company called Q, where we've introduced the Honey Badger to the commercial market and the fixed rifle and some new products. Gotcha. And that's kind of my professional career. Sweet. So I, there are a lot of, the Q is kind of infamous in, in, in the gun space. And not, even for <laughs> not, so it's not even for a lot of people in the gun space, just like, just, you know, you got the gun guys and then you have the, uh, you know, you have the gamer world is where, uh, as well that loves the honey badger so kind of give me a breakdown of the, the philosophy of how the honey badger started conceptually and where it is now today well the honey badger was a very interesting project one of the things i'm probably most proud of um we started the honey badger was spawned from a socom requirement and a joint development where it's how 300 blackout happened uh they were working with 300 whisper which was kind of the predecessor in a wildcat and it couldn't get the reliability uh functionality that they needed they were trying to put the ak cartridge in an m4 um or something equal to and then also have subsonic capability and you know the 762 by 39 the case is too tapered so it doesn't work correctly you have to open up the bolt face makes that too weak so 300 whisper uh, was a, a potentially a good solution. And they went down that road and the guns weren't reliable and talked to us about it because we were supplying silencers to most of SOCOM at the time. And Remington had just purchased the company. And so we had the uh, ability to hopefully do some ammunition development. And we did. We figured out what was wrong. You couldn't use regular 308 bullets. So we developed proper projectiles with the right O job to feed an M4. Uh, we sold that to SOCOM and they bought uppers from us to replace their M4 and 416 upper receivers to convert their guns from 556 to 300 blackout. Mm -hmm. And there was part of SOCOM that was interested in the capability, um, but they weren't interested in it in that capacity. 
on their M4s. They wanted to replace the MP5 SD, which was their, of course, nine millimeter silent submachine gun, um, which is great, but fairly anemic. So, so why why weren't they interested in using it in the in the M4 capacity? Well, I think this particular group viewed it a little differently than um, than SOCOM as a whole. They wanted it as a low visibility gun, um, more as a submachine gun, a very compact, light as we could make it, as compact as we could make it, and and focused on the subsonic capability and not the super. And the super would just be sort of, you know, if things go to shit, how do we get out of here? We have a gun that, you know, we can actually engage targets with at distance and when they have, you know, rifles or machine guns. And so it was just different philosophies. And, um, you know, so it was an interesting project for us. And that's how it started. And from that discussion, I think it was two weeks from the discussion with them that I took the first prototype for them to shoot. Two weeks. Two weeks. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And I think and they, they wanted, you know, the AR uh, controls, the ergonomics. They were familiar with that. And, the time frame is why there probably wasn't a whole new weapon developed. Um, you know, with that said, there's very few common parts between a honey badger and an AR. But I did the technical editing back then on some of the gun stuff for Call of Duty, and that's how I got the gun into Call of Duty back then. Um, and it ends up probably being the greatest marketing move I ever made, and it was partially by mistake. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't know like how big Call of Duty was and how uh -huh. every kid in the world plays it. And, and it's really made the gun very iconic. No, it really, it really has. I mean, I, I, I knew about it based on the gamer stuff prior to me learning about it as a gun guy. Yeah, I mean, you think it was one of the most famous guns in the world, at least for people under 30. Mm -hmm. And there had never been one on the commercial market. <laughs> like, no one had ever shot one except for, uh, you know, a certain part of SoCal. <laughs> there, 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 there goes the influence of the gaming community on 2A, no? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the gun is practical and it makes a lot of sense, whether you're talking about, you know, home defense or a truck gun or hunting. Um, you know, the gun is lightweight, compact, everything about it that makes it different from, you know, the MCX or some other guns, a 416, uh, guns that are bigger and heavier um, is what makes it so usable. And a lot of people, well, you know, you've, you've got one shot and done a video, but until you pick it up, you can't even understand the difference that like a pound in a, in a gun that size makes. No, you're not lying because I'll be no. the first to say, um, so, you know, you know, I, you know, and I did that night, that night hog hunt that one time here in Texas. Yeah. And I was utilizing the honey badger and it, you're real right. It, and it's going to it's going to sound so biased, but it's the truth. I, I remember we were pretty much walking. We were stalking and walking for about. 60 percent of it right you know we drive around yeah. and then we find a field and then we find a group of hogs and then we pretty much stock them from there and it was like i was carrying nothing yeah literally like i was carrying it, nothing it was so easy it it just it felt like i was cheating because i was like usually yeah. when i think about hunting i'm like oh i'm carrying this big old gun and then yada 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 <laughs> um but no it was just it was like i'm carrying this little pdw running supers out of it and it's and it's not it's not even like we were struggling to take down these hogs like it was no. it was it was it was knocking them um and yeah. i was i was really blown away by that i mean literally we're talking a pdw size gun um and and we're hog hunting with it like it was nothing yeah it's it's wonderful a lot of people i mean you just don't know until you use it you know you don't know the difference that the weight could make you don't you don't really understand that um you know for us i think as a company what's been interesting in my history and i think something that makes us very different um you know unlike other most other silencer companies or even gun companies the majority of my career was with working with SOCOM at the most elite level. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's interesting when I see big gun companies and they focus on, and you see it like trickle into the internet and all like the idiot trolls or just people who are ignorant and don't really understand. It's like, well, you know, the big army wants a gun to last 200,000 rounds and have these features. Yeah. All that's cool, but that's not something that you and I need. And it's actually a hindrance. Uh, the guys that we generally worked with, they needed mission specific stuff and they are really in action all the time. 
And that's what interested me. And that's what drives a lot of stuff for us. And, you know, that got down to weight a lot. And especially in some of the places that we fight, like you and I, it's like we're walking around all night hunting pigs and we get in like a land cruiser and we go to the next spot, you know, but guys who are doing that for months on end and, you know, mountainous places and different, you know, it, it, they don't need the extra weight. It's all about a specific target or specific mission. And that just really translates well to the commercial market. Like the SIG 226 is a good example. Mm -hmm. You know, that was Navy SEALs pistol for a very long time. And, you know, that gun is so durable and so reliable and it'll last, you know, I don't know, 150,000 rounds and people buy it based on that. And like, no one shoots like what 5,000 rounds through a handgun in their life. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you're making a lot of compromises for that. Um, and then too, you know, when Q was only 11 employees, I think we had six degreed engineers. So I love the innovation in the product and, uh, you know, I liked us being ahead of everyone else, being ahead of the curve and doing stuff that's not been done, you know, and, and so inevitably we're going to fail sometimes. Um, but we're trying a lot. Like I have no interest in being a follower. Gotcha. And I mean, I, I got to say one of the things that drew me to the honey badger, um, especially in its current configuration is how unique it is. It's, it's one of the most unique guns on the market considering the, <laughs> the ubiquitous AR platform style rifles that we have now. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you brought something up about, you know, the necessity of having a gun that's durable and will last the time, the test of times, as far as, you know, shooting a million rounds through it, um, versus a gun that's kind of more mission specific. I, I tend to look at things through a more, uh, urban environment, citizen standpoint. And yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think I could make the case for the honey badger being a good only AR platter, AR style pattern rifle for someone who's just looking for one gun. That's not a, pistol so to speak if, yeah if it's an urban environment yeah. definitely yeah. um you know you can shoot and the idea was supersonic to 300 meters that was like the the idea in doing this with, mm -hmm. with the military and you know and subsonic to 100 and beyond accurately um yeah and so in an urban engagement yeah and having the mobility and, and you think of that that even being a truck gun it's just so great um is it's so compact, so in and out of a vehicle and stuff like that, the the gun is just handy and you'll use it. And you know, it's it's like same thing with a carry gun, like the best yeah. ones, one that you'll actually carry. Yep. Um, Absolutely. But you know, I think a lot of people. I mean, it, our products, you really got to put your hands on them, and I'm sure like lots of companies say that, but you know, that's in earnest with me for this. And like, I've got lots of guns. They're, the honey badger and the fixed rifle are the only two I ever use anymore, unless it's a rim fire, maybe. <laughs> um, and, you know, you can not like me or my marketing or whatever. There is no one that can, can honestly say they don't respect those two guns if they know anything about firearms in our industry. You know, the, the fix is the first ground up firearm that we did and it's incredibly innovative i mean you see big copy uh, companies like sig now copying it already um yeah we're going to continue i think with our background and, and the level of design and engineering that we have we're going to continue to identify products on our own and niches in the market and things that we want to do and improve mm -hmm. and hopefully the greatest thing i think like with the fixed rifle nobody even knew they needed it until we did it <laughs> Wait, and, I, as I remember, you were, you were actually using a fix when we were hunting. Yeah, probably yeah. was. Yeah. yeah, I can shoot fast with it. It's got a short bolt throw, and a lot of the drawbacks from traditional bolt guns we eliminated with that. Um, you know, and it's handy because, you know, I hunt a lot, and I go internationally hunting, and mm. you can't take, you know, AR platform guns into most countries. Yeah. And so the bolt gun, and it was something interesting for me. Like, it's the first product I've ever made we can sell in California. Mm. Um, so that's cool. So let's talk. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So, because what I want to kind of talk about is the three hundred, the three hundred blackout as a round in and of itself. I think that there's a lot of misconceptions and a, and a lack of understanding about the philosophy behind the three hundred blackout. Like you kind of touched on it a little bit when you were talking about the honey badger. Um, but yeah. But generally speaking, like if somebody goes, okay, what is the purpose of the three hundred blackout? I love the three hundred blackout. I, I shoot it a lot. 
Um, yep. it, it's, it's the round I use for all my truck gun stuff. It's the round I use for my home defense stuff. Um, but, and I, I tend to, I like to think I have a better understanding of it than most, but for, for someone yeah. who doesn't, it comes to you and say, okay, what's, what's this whole 300 blackout stuff? What, what's, what's the purpose? What, what is the do well, better than say the sure. 762 by 39 or the 556? Five, five, yeah. Well, 762 by 39. Yeah, those are kind of separate discussions, in my opinion. Five, five, six. Here's the thing: it's designed for long barrels, and the only reason you would ever choose five, five, six over three hundred blackout is if you're okay with a long barrel and you want to shoot far. If you want to shoot inside three hundred meters, three hundred blackout is better in every single regard. Except it may be more expensive, and the ammo itself is a little heavier. Mm -hmm. But th there is nothing. If you want a short barrel AR. Five five six is stupid. It's better. It's better than. Well, I mean, it's better than no gun. Like I have some, and it, it's okay. Well, no, but I'm laughing because I got I, into a huge argument with my friend about. I did. I did the video on the Ragnarok, which was like a a, a four point seven five inch barrel five five six, and I said it was useless. Uh, dumbest thing ever. Well, and, yeah. he, and we got into an argument. He says the gun. He's like, it's not useless. So, but go, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, it's better than no gun. And if somebody's carjacking you and you stick the muzzle in their mouth and you shoot them with it, I mean, it's good for that, I guess. But beyond that, it's useless. So, like, 300 Blackout was designed for 9-inch barrels, like the initial ammo. Mm -hmm. And so what that means, it's a thirty caliber bullet, but the bullets are designed to expand at the lower velocities. Gotcha. And, and you still have a lot of energy. They're big, heavy bullets. With 5.56, five, it is essentially like 22, 22 mag. It's not useless but in a platform that size like to me it's the same thing if you said if you have two guns that are the same size and the same weight and they've got 14 inch barrels and one's a nine millimeter and one's a 223 mm -hmm. or 556 five, and you can argue about nine millimeter being better all you want you know ammo availability what but if you're talking about actually shooting stuff with it the nine millimeter in that instance would be stupid it's the same thing with short barrel um ar guns like, why would you not have the most lethal thing you can if it is for defense? And then with 300 Blackout 2, you get the subsonic rounds. And as you know, with the silencer, it's ridiculously quiet. It's a ton of fun. You can shoot un you know, unnoticed or without creating to tons of noise pollution, bothering your neighbors. Um, so you just have a lot more capability with it. There is, again, the only reason our place 556 is better is if you're shooting... You want to shoot longer distance. That's all it is. And so, so what is it about the what is it about the three hundred blackout that makes it less effective at longer distance? Well, the well, the bullet drops more, and gotcha. yeah, so and it's more affected by wind and stuff like that. So, with, with two two three, you have a flatter trajectory, so your probability is better with that. But other than that, but you know, I shoot three hundred blackout nine inch barrels to a thousand yards. So, you know, you can do it, mm -hmm. um, but it depends on what you're trying to do. You know, to me, I always, you know, I, I think about two things. Like one is killing for me is like hunting and the most efficient way to do that. And then I think about like target shooting and having fun. And um, then, you know, I want subsonic and I shoot subsonic 300 blackout regularly out to five and 600 yards. Subsonic. And just, yeah. And was just recently on a trip, a guy had never shot a gun before and his buddy had never shot a silence gun before and i had the mini fix and 300 blackout with an eight inch barrel the one in five twist a one a six power one to six on it he um we set up a 20 by 20 plate and went all the way out to 457 yards and the guy had never shot a gun before you know i i zeroed the gun and everything uh -huh. his first hit hit it on his first shot <laughs> could not believe it you know, the flight time for subsonic huge with that. Yes. Um, but it's just a lot of fun. Um, so, but then with 762 by 39, the downside of that, if you want to put it in 762 by 39, the bolt velocity is generally very high because the case is tapered. So there's not a lot of friction when you extract the cartridge, mm -hmm. the, the shell once you fired the round. Um, and it requires a full curve magazine because of the extreme taper of the case. So you can't have a full curve magazine in an AR. You know, AK mag is full curve and AR is not. Gotcha. Um, so, so that doesn't work very well. And then you can't get full mag capacity. And then you have to open up the bolt face of the AR for 762 by 39. 
and it weakens the lugs in the bolt face so much that you break bolts, um, which sucks. And then, um, you know, other disadvantages, maybe people are making good ammo now, but when we were going through this exercise, when we started the honey badger, they originally our 300 blackout. They originally wanted 762 by 39 and SOCOM went down that road trying to do that. God. It just wasn't feasible. So that's where they ended up with 300 whisper. And then with us with 300 blackout, be, be, uh, be, be, not feasible because of platform availability or, or the yeah, type because of platform. Of platform. Okay. And then too, when you get guys who are maybe, you know, snipers or our military, especially, you know, SOCOM are very well trained. Uh, they get a lot of trigger time. A lot of the guys can really shoot. At the time, there was no 762 by 39 ammo in the world that the SDs were good, you know, the standard deviation, I mean, muzzle velocity. So accuracy was crap in all the ammo. There was no subsonic that was available at the time. Um, so there was just a lot of downsides to it. And, you know, it just didn't make, I mean, there's still not any good 762 by 39 ammo that I've ever seen. I mean, then, you know, like Winchester maybe makes some better stuff now, but, you know, most of the ammo is made, you know, in, you know, dirt floor factories around the world by 11 year olds. Gotcha. Now, no, okay. So let's say we took a 300, nine inch 300 blackout and say we took like a, a nine inch AK 47 Draco, right? Yeah. It, notwithstanding, the platform, just the, there's just a round, right? Yeah. Let's say we found a 300 blackout from a quality of round standpoint that that was synonymous to, that was synonymous to the AK round, right? What would yeah. you What would you prefer in terms of, of energy on target? Is there is there a difference in that regard? Like, so I'm like, okay, well, it makes sense. You know, I want to shoot 300 blackout because I'm trying to avoid saying knockdown power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, but, just energy. Yes, just energy, just energy on target between the two rounds all, out of the same barrel length. What, what what are we looking at there? They're they're very comparable, and, and you can actually sort of manipulate it to to, to favor either one. Uh, Three hundred blackout overall has a slight advantage. I don't count it, but you know when you're saying everything the same, but the reality is things aren't the same. Yeah. You know, the ammo is not as consistent. But one thing that gives you a lot more energy with 300 blackout, and then also we're doing a new cartridge like it's Big Brother for 308 base guns called the 86 blackout. When you spin the bullet faster, so when we have a one in five or a one in three twist, because we, we measure energy now with, um, you know, bullet weight and then linear velocity. velocity. But no one ever has calculated, um, you know, the rotational velocity, like the RPMs. And that also is energy that's delivered into a target. So we get much more energy with fast twist barrels with everything else being the same. And, you know, discrete ballistics probably a month or two ago posted a video mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's, they make a great quality sub and supersonic ammo and they're in New Hampshire and a real brilliant guy, David Stark owns that company. And so we do work with him. So my engineers like Ethan Lassard doing some projects with him working on our new cartridge. And he posted a video of two gelatin blocks being shot in the same, uh, on the same post, one just right above each other, split screen. And the only difference is the same bullets, a supersonic, I think 150 grain Barnes or some kind of solid copper bullet, maybe a discrete ballistics bullet. Um, the only difference is One's a one in seven twist and one's a one in four. And the one in four has three times the energy. It looks like the initial Jesus. wound, the initial. And so everybody can go and watch the videos. The initial wound cavity is three times the size. And every bit of that muzzle velocity was the same. Every bit of it. The difference is from rotational velocity and that being energy. So that's a way that we're able to also do these things. And then we start talking about the platforms. It's well, you know, the AK platform ergonomics kind of suck. Yeah. You don't get good, you know, like all those things and they're heavy. So, you know, like, I love AKs. I love all guns. Yeah. Same here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and I shoot a lot of Soviet stuff. I've got a pretty big machine gun collection and Soviet machine guns are awesome. Um, but when it comes to the AK or an AR platform, I mean, there's no, it's not a real comparison <laughs> in, in most cases. It's just not, and I'm not hating on it. Yeah. Like, I love it. It's just we we have more flexibility and, and ability to modernize AR-based guns.
I, mean, so, I, don't, you know, like, I don't disagree with you. I like my first rifle was an AK. So yeah. for me, you know, I, I kind of have a natural bias there. But as time yeah. has gone on, I, I definitely have a lot more experience behind AR pattern rifles. And, and then as far as 300 blackout, like I said, I think I shoot 300 blackout if we're gonna if we're gonna split it down the middle. Whew, I, 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 I think we're talking about maybe almost 50 50. Yeah, that's incredible yeah um because like i said I, for all my my uh, for all my personal kind of defense stuff i'm utilizing 300 blackout so like i said my trunk my truck guns, yeah 300 blackout my home defense rifles 300 blackout yeah my ars are for my my 556 five, are for like you said for for longer engage like if, if i was in a situation where i had yeah. to engage something longer but even then yeah. like if I'm really honest, I, I'd probably pick up my 6.5. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, th I think that is a thing. Like, this is what I try to explain to people. Like, 5.56, five, you know, everyone's shot that. And if you've ever hunted or anything, it's like you shoot stuff with 5.56. Five, like, I mean, I kill whitetail with 2.23. Two, mm -hmm. um, but I always prefer to shoot anything with a 3.08. It's just way more effective. Now, the downside 308, none of us carry that as a truck gun generally because the guns are too big and heavy. Heavy, yeah. Like, you're not, a, you know, you're not a huge guy. I'm not a huge guy. Like, the guns are just too big and heavy. Like, I, it, so 300 blackout sort of in the middle. Yep. And, and you know, with the bullets being designed for short barrels, what people don't realize, it, the projectile, we started, we picked, well, SOCOM picked nine inches is what they wanted the barrel to be. Mm -hmm. So, the velocities that we're getting out through the blackout nine inch barrel, that's what like the Barnes 110 bullet, the Hornady GMX 110 designed around at that velocity to expand inside 300 meters. That That's what it's for. And for instance, if you wanted a 12 and a half inch 308 and you buy a Barnes 308 ammo and you hunt with it and it's, you know, you've got some little, let's say, AR based pistol that's a 308 12 and a half inch. The bullets aren't going to expand, and it's because you've lost too much muzzle velocity. So what I do in that situation is I get the Barnes 110 grain bullets. Mm -hmm. They're awesome. It's TTSXs or whatever they are, or the GMX from Hornady, and I load those in my 308 308 because those bullets are designed to expand at lower velocity. And then I get, like, the lethality and the energy out of a 12-and-a-half-inch 308, and the bullets expand like they would if the barrel were 20 inches. Mm. So, so you know— no, I was just, there's just lots of tricks. And with the short 308, we spin those faster too. And that helps. That helps bullets to expand. And that, again, puts more energy into the target, um, rotational and linear uh, velocity. So it's, so, so, what are some of the downsides, if any, of, of, of having a high rotation spin on, on a bullet versus? Um, so depending on where you go, uh, meaning we stopped at one in five with 300 blackout because SOCOM had adopted a subsonic bullet and the bullet would come apart at one and four out of the muzzle. Mm -hmm. So if you, most machines can't cut, uh, barrels, uh, below, uh, one turn in seven inches. So it limits who can make barrels. That's one downside. Um, you know, just availability. The other side is commercially available bullets for old twist, like 308, one and 10, one and 11. Mm -hmm. Uh, some come apart and generally the way it works, if you have a non bonded, bullet it'll come apart that's the first one that'll spin apart out of the muzzle if you spin it fast then bonded then solid coppers uh generally the way it works so with eight six we're making the call right now actually with twist um because we want to spin it really fast because it gives your spinning it fast too gives you long subsonic slow bullets it gives you better accuracy okay um so that's a big reason to do it so eight six our requirement internal requirement uh, we're trying it, trying to make it the first sub MOA to 300 meter subsonic gun. And really we stop at 300 meters because your flight time is so long. If you're hunting, you know, the animal has time to move a significant amount. If you go to like 400 meters, not to say you couldn't do it, but, um, so those are our requirements. We're trying to spin it fast, but we we're stopping where we are and we could go a little faster because, if we go as fast as we want just for the bullets we're doing, then no commercially 8.6 is 338 caliber. Mm -hmm. So none of those bullets will be usable. So we're kind of stopping to where if you have a bonded bullet or a solid copper, you know, that's a bullet that's been produced for 338 Lapua or 338, you know, whatever, 
um, you're going to be able to use those bullets, guys, that load. So, you know, these are all like choices. When it comes to all of these things, um, you know, I have to decide what is the correct choice at the end of it for our military customer or even the commercial market. Um, you know, I always want to push technology, but we can always go too far, yeah. you know, for it's not good timing or we don't have the support for ammo or, you know, there's only one person that can make the barrel. Like if I go to a one and two twist, there's only like two people that can make my barrels. And, you know, that, that, you know, Pacnor burned down last year, stuff happens and then we're hamstrung. So we've got to make, you know, sort of all encompassing decisions. Uh, and, you know, I hate compromise, but inevitably it's what you have to do with these sorts of things. There have to be compromises. Gotcha. So now you, now you mentioned something about how, you know, there was this balancing act between, you know, spinning a spinning a subsonic bullet that could go out to three, four hundred yards, um, but then dealing with the flight times in regards to the animal's reaction. Um, yeah. But but with a subsonic bullet, though, I mean, that's. 300 blackout subsonic to me is probably one of the suppressed is probably one of the quietest rounds I've ever heard. Oh, it's great. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's not so. Cause even, even when we were hunting, you know, we were still, we were shooting supers. Um, yeah. and so you still had that, you know, you had that sonic boom crack. So yeah. with a lot of the misconceptions that people have or lack of knowledge people have about 300 blackout, they're just a lot of those same people have a lot of misconceptions and just overall lack of knowledge about silencers so yeah i mean even a lot of the manufacturers you know 20 years ago there's only like four of us making silencers now there's like a hundred and even stuff i try not to look anymore i don't like being influenced by other firearms companies generally now at all mm -hmm. um you know i just think we're in a good spot but there's so much misinformation about silencers out there and i can't believe how much of it comes from manufacturers that and I don't think they're being trying to be misleading. They're just really ignorant to it. What what would be the biggest one? Not the not the not as far as manufacturers, but the biggest misconceptions or misinformation that you've seen out there, or or just some of them. I think titanium silencers not being good for semi-auto. That's a stupid one. Uh, people um, like flow through technology. Most of that has just been total bullshit. Um, you know, mounting systems. I don't, I mean, you can pick a thing and I'll go through it, you know, welding. Like I know we've taken some criticism for not, uh, for the way we weld our titanium silencers. You know, that's like a way to attack, to, to attack us, you know, windy at the top people pick on what, whatever. Um, but you know, we got to a point then where, okay, we want to produce this many a month and we can do a weld. The welding that we're doing is, probably five times what we need and it could be three percent better if we did it in a way that if we listen to you know like people who just weld or haters or other companies but it would cut our capacity in half and we already have a safety factor more than we need Gotcha. And so, you know, there's just like a lot of things like what is actually important with a silencer? Um, you know, I've said it before, Ethan and I, Ethan has been in charge of my engineering for a dozen years. Uh, he and I have worked and tested, worked on and tested more silencers than probably anyone in the entire world at this point, commercially and with the military and in conjunction with the military, real military testing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not like big army stuff that is you know, somebody in an office sort of drawing something up and deciding this is good, but like actual destruction testing on things. Um, so we could make the quietest silencer in the world. We can do all these things, but at the end, we have to make something that we can manufacture that doesn't hurt your accuracy, doesn't, uh, you know, affect the reliability of the weapon. Um, it has to be affordable. Um, you know, there's like all these things that kind of go into it. And at the end of the day, just like the honey badger and the fix, it needs to be light. Yeah. It's on the end of your gun. So we can make more complicated silencers that cost $2,000 and weigh 30 ounces. But who the hell wants them? <laughs> I mean, everybody says thinks, uh, even commercially, oh, sound is the most important. It kind of, to a point. Um, That's interesting you point out that. I, 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 as I've used more silencers in my, in my time, Sound really hasn't 
like being the quietest isn't that important to me. No. It just isn't. I now really honestly run suppressors and silencers to mitigate the kind of the, the unnecessary report, right? To, to, to just kind of yeah. Yeah, just, just even it out a little bit so it's just not just overwhelming. Um that for me, that's that, as far as it being the quietest in the world. Yes, do I get do I get giddy when I shoot a subsonic during the blackout? That's just super quiet. Yes, but not yeah. for me. I, I, if if it didn't, from a functional standpoint, I'd be just fine. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. We, we're gonna be shooting here this afternoon when it cools off a little bit. And got steel painted up and everything, and we got to do some different things. And I've got two categories of guns for me. I have ones. We got some some people here, family and stuff, that are pretty inexperienced with guns. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a honey badger here with a thunder chicken on it. That's our longer silencer. Mm -hmm. And we've got a mini fix and 300 blackout with an eight inch barrel with a thunder chicken on that. And that is because that's the wow factor. You know, there is quiet, just about as quiet as you can possibly get with subsonic. And we're going to do that. And then I have my hunting guns here as well. And those are the smallest silencers that I can get on the guns to where I don't notice the shot when I shoot something, you know, and it's like, it's still loud, yeah. but you know, it doesn't ring my ears when I shoot an animal or I'm doing those sorts of things and I don't notice the shot. Um, and in that instance, I want the most compact thing possible. Like I want to protect my hearing. I don't want to do anything else, but there are times like today, a big part of our day today will be, you know, having a picnic and kind of like playing golf with your buddies. Yeah. We want it to be as enjoyable as possible, you know, for the women that are here and the kids and all that stuff. And so then I want that as quiet as possible, but you know, I don't build a silencer that's three feet long, even though it'd be the quietest thing in the world. Cause it's just not practical. And, you know, I think what's tough and I think where I've been good at doing things at, at the company is you have to have a leader who will identify what is important, you know, why you're doing it, set goals, priorities, and that's how you execute. And I think, you know, I, I've been doing this now 27 years and I think I've got a good feel for the market and what people want. And I think it's tough to argue. I mean, you know, you look at the honey badger, you look at 300 blackout um silencers i was probably a big part of making those mainstream mm-hmm. um 300 blackout would have never happened had it not been for me and i saw right away oh my god this is going to help our troops uh the guys we were working with and then i thought 300 blackout is like the the 30 30 for my generation um mm-hmm. it's just a great utility cartridge it just is and and, and you know what's made it even more popular are, are the stupid arm braces like it's great now we can have short barrels on it you know because before you got to have a 16 inch barrel it's like well then you put a silencer on it it's long it's kind of heavy and now we have arm braces so we can have short barrels without having to go through all the 200 dollars and the year wait you know because computers apparently are that slow Um, (laughs) so from a civilian standpoint if you're gonna what like if somebody was civilian on the market and they were like all right i want to get a silencer what type of silencer should I get in terms of not necessarily brand, but just what should they be looking for in terms of making that decision in terms of what silencer they should get? They're only going to get one. What would you recommend? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think this is debated in our industry. And I think as usual, I'm right. Mm -hmm. Um, With that being said, I'm wrong. Like most of the time, (laughs) but I think with silencers, I hate the multi caliber or the do it all silencers. Like, uh, silencer co has the hybrid mm-hmm. and I hate that. And it drives me crazy that they do it. And not for me. Like I look, I want everyone to own a silencer. I can't make them all. So I love there being other companies and other ideas, but what sucks about that and what pisses me off is I feel very loyal to my employees and consumers. And if you buy that silencer and some bozo in a gun shop tells you it's going to do everything from your 22 to your 4570, your 300 wind mag, your AR, it sucks for every single thing. So it's not an experience. It's not a good experience. Yeah. And I don't know how many people buy the hybrid and then buy another silencer. But I tell people, like, first time silencer, I love 22s. Mm-hmm. And it's the way to get your family involved. It, it, you know, it's, it's just a great shooting experience. So Rimfire is great, but that's not what most people go with now. But I tell them to go with the trash panda or the thunder chicken because they can move it around from gun to gun easier because it attaches to one of our muzzle devices. Mm-hmm. And then it's, and they ask me which one. And I'm like, if I am primarily hunting or I'm shooting with my buddies, 
I want the trash panda because it's shorter, more compact, lighter weight, easier to handle with the gun. And if you're going to be shooting with your kids or you live in a, you know, on your property or whatever, and you got neighbors close then go with the thunder chicken because it's the quietest. And those are the two that I recommend. And I think are good choices because they give everyone a great first time experience. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cause I know I, mean, that- I think go ahead. you got to dedicate them to the gun and to the caliber. There's not one, you know, a do all. Uh, it, so, just- so basically it's like you, you need to determine the platform, the caliber, then you determine what silencer you want to go with? Because I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I thought initially when I first got into silencers, my thing is, oh, yeah, well, if I'm just going to do one, you know, I, I get the one that, you know, that, that that can accommodate the most calibers. Yeah. Well, you know, you and I both like cars, mm-hmm. for instance. Yeah. And you've got a couple of cool cars, and I've got cool cars. And, like, right now, my daily driver is a Suburban. Mm. And I like it, you know, especially, like, if I drive from New Hampshire to Georgia. Yeah. I can sleep in the back because there's a full mattress in the back. But like, it doesn't do anything <laughs> really well uh-huh. other other than haul a bunch of shit. There's just room in it. Yeah. You know, And but I take it to the grocery store. I take it, my son and his homies to the skate park. I take it when we snowboard. Like, it, but if I'm just going driving or something fun, like if I'm going out with my woman, I don't want to take the damn Suburban. It sucks. <laughs> it's just like... You know, yeah. because yep. I can put plywood in the back, but it's not a pickup truck. It's aggravating. You know, there's just like, I mean, you you know. No, it's no. Like, I mean, when you when you draw the car analogy, the car analogy works perfect. Yeah. You know, for me, it's like I was just uh, I was just in Austin and, you know, I was in hill country. And it's like I'm on some of the roads. I'm like, man, a Porsche, yeah. 911, a Porsche 911 GT3 would be awesome right now. Because I was That's like, right. yeah, I wasn't doing anything practical. I'm just driving around, just driving around and trying to get some R&R. Um, so yeah, no, that, yeah. That, that makes perfect sense. But as far and, as and like, I think like go when I get, when I go on hunts, some of my hunts cost $50,000, mm-hmm. you know, when I go to the other side of the world. And so I use Swarovski optics, you know, I use the fix, the best bolt gun, utility gun in the world, like whatever I need to go and do that. And it's like, when I'm driving my kids around, the Suburban's cool. When I go to track day, you know, I'm not taking the Suburban. I'm with you on a GT3 or take my Lamborghini. Yeah. Like. You know, why the hell would I take my Suburban track day? <laughs> so, you know, and like when I go on a hunt, okay, I'm taking the stuff that I need. Or if I'm going to go shoot, you know, you know, just the, you know, I don't know. It'd be like when people are like, I want one silencer. Okay, do you have one gun? You know, do you carry like a Glock 10 millimeter so you can shoot like Black Bear and keep it in your car and for self That's stupid. Gotcha. So, so from a hunting standpoint... <laughs> How important are silencers when it comes to hunting, at least for you from a personal standpoint? Oh, I, I wouldn't hunt if I couldn't use silencers. My kids wouldn't hunt with me. Um, I wouldn't do it. Well, I probably still would hunt, but not nearly as much as I do. You, you know, I don't notice the shot. You don't scare other game. I can hear the impact on the animal when I'm using a silencer. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's just every benefit possible. The only downside to using a silencer when you hunt is the added length and weight to the gun. Everything else is a positive. Gotcha. So like I, you know, when, when I'm with my kids, I can communicate with them and stuff, or even with my buddies, mm-hmm. you know, cause I'm not shooting a two sixty or six, five without hearing protection. Yeah. <laughs> be a long day. Yeah. <laughs> because so I, I, I planned on um, having John from a uh, war poet society. And I remember he, we were supposed to be talking about, um, you know, the idea of running as a silencer for home defense. And so since I have you on here now, what are, you, what are your thoughts on running a silencer? His, his fire breathing dragon, uh, whatever about the psychology of the noise scaring people. I, th- I mean, look to each his own and I don't know, I've not shot a bunch of people in my house, but it seems ridiculous. Like if I have to shoot someone, or someone's inside my house, I'm not going to assume that they're trying to rob me. I'm going to assume they're trying to kill me. Like, I'm not trying to scare them. I'm trying to kill them. And silencers are more effective for that in general. Um, You know, just being able to hear what's going on, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, to hide your location to some degree. I mean, there's no way I would like, well, you're going to have a short barrel five, five, six or 300 blackout or whatever in your house with your kids and start popping rounds off at, 
two in the morning? I got a silencer? No I, way. I'm not gonna lie, personally, I dread the I dread the idea of having to shoot an SBR inside my house without a silencer, personally. Um I would oh man. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't I don't I don't agree with that whole mentality of trying to, you know, intimidate people with that. Like I would assume if you're like ballsy enough to break into someone's house, you're either in the middle of the night, you're committed to hurting them or yeah. either you're like you know, you have some mental issue or you're, um, you know, some psychological problem or you're on drugs. Yeah. And so, so, you know, like the psychology that would work on you and I right now, is probably not going to be effective. Yeah. I don't, that, my personal thing. I, I, I like him and I like his videos and he's got a lot of cool stuff, but I heard him like talk about that and I can, could not disagree with him more. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, as normal, you know, there's there's always some controversy going on in the interwebs and social media space. Yeah. Um, I don't know very much about it, but there, there's been some controversy with regard to you as well. I know some of my, when I said that you were going to be on the podcast, some of the people wanted you to kind of address it or talk about it, I guess. I hadn't really followed it closely, unfortunately, as much as I love you. I, ha I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to kind of get into that a little bit? Or, I mean, what do you want to do? I mean, it's, it's something that I generally avoid because I have kids. Um mm -hmm. You know, but sure. I mean, I, I get a lot of it sent to me and most of it is false. Um, and, and I'm not going to speak a lot about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that important, you know, like, and the story is complex, but I have three children who I've had full custody of since they were very young. Um, and that's an unfortunate situation. And their mother is, you know, she followed us to New Hampshire and she's got, um, you know, she's got issues that are very difficult to address and I hate it for her and I hate it for our kids. Um, but you know, it's pretty rare for a man to have full custody in all decision-making, especially in the South. Yeah. Being, um, being an attorney, uh, I will, I will, I will confirm. That. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we've had not an awesome time over the last 10 years. Um, but yeah, she is finally had success in New Hampshire with, uh, you know, causing me trouble. And, you know, I probably should have taken steps years ago to sort of remedy that. Um, you know, I have never wanted to do anything that would cause my children to have to pick a side or be involved in anything or, you know, know things, uh, certain things about, our situation or their mother. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's sad because all the stuff, you know, with my arrest and, you know, like, what do you do? It's, it, it, it's like all the stuff that I see people send on the internet that I've been arrested for, yeah. but it's just like, it, 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 she tried it in Georgia, but in New Hampshire, she'd say, Oh, I was walking down the sidewalk and you tried to run over me with this car and they send the SWAT team to my house, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so then she and her police, new police friends, like leak my mug shots and stuff like that. And I don't particularly care, but it does suck. Like when the anonymous little trolls, they send stuff to my children. And that seems kind of oh, unfortunate because, wow. you know, they've had to live through this stuff. And, you know, like I'm a human being. I've made mistakes. I've mostly done right by my children and my family. Um, you know, and, and we have a very unfortunate situation um but you know we're also extremely lucky yeah. um but it'd be interesting to dig into anyone's personal life and <laughs> you know to me i i love that you know because a lot of the stuff i've seen that's anonymously posted um you know some of this stuff is, is not legal that's been done uh but just because people think they can go and post anonymously oh you know kevin was arrested and 2006 for a sexual assault like that's just made up it's not true yeah like 99 percent of the stuff that's out there did not happen um or you've got one side of these things and you know this stuff happens in everyone's life and i don't care it's but well, so our competitors and some of you know the little haters go and post a lot of things anonymously and they think they're anonymous and as you and i both know it's yeah, not nothing anonymous on there. Yeah. and yeah and a couple of them have been deposed and you know, my attorneys went to their states and knocked on their door and served them and deposed them. And, um, 
And that's been pretty funny and interesting to me. But they spend their time, you know, like one little kid in New Mexico I know that's trying to be a competitor spends all of his time focused on my personal life. It cracks me up because he's not focusing on his work. And then like, how weird is that if you're a dude focused on another dude's personal life? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, whatever. It's America. Do what you want. Yeah. But, you know, I, I always think back to when Robert Downey Jr., right before the year before Iron Man, mm -hmm. where he filmed that, he was on TMZ and like court TV or whatever, constantly in the news for being arrested, you know, and like, it was very unfortunate. He had like a drug problem. Yeah. Um, a year later, he's the highest paid movie star in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, like, do I care? Like I didn't set out to make friends in this industry. I didn't set out to, you know, be voted to the board of the NRA. I don't, you know, I set out to do what I want and to be innovative and to kick ass. And that's what I do. And man, I, I mean, I make so many mistakes every day, my personal life and professionally. And that grown men spend their time tracking my movements and personal life. Um, but tell, I mean, you know, if you own a business, you look at it, it's what it tells me I'm doing something right. Yeah. They spend their time on me. Yeah. No, like, it's, it's, it's you know, I know all about being in the crosshairs of people. Yeah, of are, course you do. Yeah. You know. go Uncle Tom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I, it's weird because it's like I never expected to be in a situation where I'm like getting it from all sides. It's kind of weird. Like in the same day, I got called a black supremacist race baiter and then somebody called me anti-black. It was weird. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I don't really know. Uh, yeah. I don't really know what to do with this. But. I you know I understand it because uh, the latest thing was too, and you know like you you and I have a personal relationship or mm -hmm. friends. It, it's like what I see is I mean you you know how it goes because you've had it way worse than me. Is you know I've just like given them some ammunition, which is probably unfortunate, but um, but you you know and it's, it's interesting too because you know I just won the lawsuit with the city, yeah. so that just happened a couple of days ago. So now they're having to pay me. Um, yeah. And just because the cops do something doesn't mean they were right. Like, yeah. you know, m maybe they're dating somebody that's pretending to be a victim and they make some mistakes based on that. <laughs> um, so like, whatever. Uh, but the latest thing, cause you know, it's, it's like, they'll post that. And then some people like mock me or they'll send messages to my kids and like, and even my kids don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. Uh, but then that doesn't work. So then they start making up stuff. Oh, you know, Kevin can't own guns. Kevin can't touch guns. Kevin doesn't own his company. No, like, it goes to that. You no, know, like the latest one I saw from like the, the same little fella. And then we found out through discovery, it's four companies that have like the primary meme page that attacks me mm -hmm. and there are competitors <laughs> and it's, and it's four of them that are involved. And, you know, of course my attorney wants to do something about it. And I just think it's hilarious. Cause I'm like, well, they spend their time and, and, and it's like free marketing. And like, wh what are they going to say? It's another sense of freedom that they unintentionally gave me by yeah. you want to out my personal life. And I don't even have to talk about the other side. The, if anybody with half a brain understands the fact that since my children were very young, I've had full custody, all decision-making and their mother was supervised with them for a period of time. That, that says a lot. And, <laughs> and, I, and I love her. She's their, she's their mother. I was in love with her from the time I met her, but you know, unfortunately she's got issues that, I can't fix and neither can the kids. And I think it's one place family court. The woman has a distinct advantage and don't, no judge wants to be the eight line don't, judge. Don't get me started on that. Yeah. So, so no matter what happens over and over and over, but I bet we'll probably start to see some change now that the county's starting to have to, or the city's having to write me checks. <laughs> I, I bet they'll take a different tactic. And if not like, okay. Like, thank you for paying for my new swimming pool. <laughs> like, you, you can let you, you can let your officers handcuff me and put me on the ground, start kicking me. You want to buy me another pool? Like, okay, like, I can go to jail for three days. Like, it's just fasting. I mean, yeah. I lose fifteen pounds. Big deal. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 those things. But oh, the latest one was that I. And it's a weird thing too, you know, being from the south. So I'm a racist, and they can't stand me because I'm. Um, racist and you know hate black people <laughs> it's like Wait, where did I, 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 i've honestly never heard that where, where the where'd that come from that was the latest thing somebody sent to me that um yeah the kid uh josh parker in new mexico works for cgs and zev 
you know, he's like, got it out for me. I mean, basically because we kicked their ass and I hurt his feelings. And, you know, I saw he sent that to someone the other day and it's like, oh my Lord. Um, yeah. Huh. You, you know, and it's, it's just the shit. It's, I can imagine what people do to you because it's like, oh, he's from the South. He must be racist. It's like, yeah, I, so racist. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 you know, I, I just, I just did a podcast with Grant Thumb and we kind of talked about, you know, dealing with the negative comments and the, the shit that people throw away whenever we're, uh, you know, when you're in the spotlight and, you know, I, I, I'd like to be able to engage with my audience. And unfortunately what comes with that is that I have to then see some of the bullshit. Um, and it's a lot. <laughs> and it's pretty consistent. Yeah, it, yeah. um, it kind of scares me sometimes, but not in a way that people think. It scares me because it's like there are some really substantially monumentally stupid people out there. Um, and I'm like, and there are more of them than I thought. And so the more I see it, the more terrified I get because I'm like, holy crap, that's a like these are people kind of walking around society now. Um, and I also find it odd in a lot of ways because, you know, I, I'd like to think that in our in our space, right, um, as far as the gun community is concerned, that, you know, we pride ourselves on being very rational, very logical um, and, and trying to be objective. But it's amazing to me how some people can get a little piece of information and then they'll, they'll spread it like wildfire, or like wildfire, like it's the gospel without actually taking a second oh. to step back to say, hold on, wait a minute. Let me let me find out yeah. if this is actually true or if there's another side to this. I've known yeah, a lot of Go ahead. As most people don't care, you know, you know, because you're involved in politics and mm -hmm. interested in it, and, and people don't care. It's just like getting the message out there. That propaganda. Yeah. One thing, social media just makes it so easy. One thing that I saw, well, when they started doing, we started like the discovery process with a couple of these guys and deposing them and stuff. Almost everyone that posts this stuff is like 16 to 22 years old. <laughs> <laughs> And I think how dumb I was at 40. And it's like, oh, my Lord. If I was able to reach everyone in the world when I was 16, like with every emotion and hormone that I had at the time, yeah. Jesus. You know, you know, who cares? It's, it's funny you brought that up because I, I do I do tend to forget that sometimes, too. You know, I remember, you know, uh, me being a huge Drake fan. Uh, there was a line in one of the – there was a, a, line, a verse – a line in one of the songs that he did and basically was talking about, you know, how he'd see a negative comment and that somebody makes – to him and then he'll get angry and then go look who it is and it's like it's like a little kid who you can tell is just angry at the world and wants to want somebody else to feel their feel their anger and their pain and it's like kind of so sobers you up a little bit like oh this this really isn't worth it um, yeah i you know i just look when i look at myself and it, it's i love making mistakes because i learn and i grow from them i'm different than i was a year ago and 10 years ago and i'm fine with that and all these experiences change me in some way like typically you would be afraid to go to jail or if you own a company for that to become public yeah but once you face things like that and the only thing that happened after was the company grew 200 hmm. percent. like i don't so basically what you're telling me is i'm so good at my job <laughs> i can <laughs> and still i can still grow the company like that um you know at the end of the day i think i I love innovation and I love quality and that's, that's all I care about. And I don't care about the rest of it. I mean, you look at our company, it's four years old yeah. and all these guys that anonymously and plus like you are the biggest wuss in the entire world. If you have to anonymously post like you don't deserve to post anything like what kind of little girl are you? <laughs> Like I got a problem with a lot of people. I'll tell it to them. Or if I post something, it's always under my name. Yeah. Um, you know, my mom didn't raise any daughters and I don't, I don't have any respect for that. It, it's, it, and, and, and there's, there's plenty of criticism about me and I'm wrong all the time. And I try to improve every day and change, but I mean, it is ridiculous. And it's funny to me when they start like fabricating things. Cause there's like enough stuff you could say about me. That's actually fact and people, <laughs> but at the end of the day, People just want the product. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter if I turn into a crackhead. Like people are still <laughs> going to buy the honey badger. They're still going to buy our silencers. You know, like I don't particularly like the CEO of General Motors right now. Mm -hmm. Don't care. They make the suburban. I needed a suburban. <laughs> like, it, you know, so like people doing that and acting like, oh well, don't buy from Q because Kevin's a jackass. Well, okay, so. But on your emotion, we're going to buy a lesser product that's going to serve you not as well as something. Oh. Exactly. 
yeah, as people I don't want as a customer anyway. Yep. No, it's yeah, just- you know, and it's it's like not. I don't think the average people do exceptional things most of the time. Like, you know, you want somebody to develop 300 Blackout, the next 300 Blackout, or the Honey Badger, the next generation Bolt, or whatever it is, the next car. It's not going to be like the normal dude, typically. No, nope. it's not. It's not at all, actually. <laughs> no, and you know, for me, no, nothing anyone would say to me would hurt me in any way unless it's someone I admire, look up to, or respect. And, you know, so that could be you, that could be Reed Knight, you know, that, that could be my grandmother, but you know, that ain't some little wannabe building half-ass ARs, painting them like the honey badger. <laughs> oh man, that's why I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just facts. Yeah. I, you it's, know, it, it's... if you don't do anything that I admire or respect, I don't give a shit what you say. Uh, and, and especially when they critique our business or my marketing. Yeah. You know, I, I personally, marketing. I personally love it. I, I, I hate redundancy. Thanks. I hate for things to become stale and static. I, I love to inject person. I mean, anybody who's watched my videos or my gun reviews knows that about me. So it, it's only natural that I love, I love the way you approach marketing. It's, it's, it's very colorful. It's very flamboyant. And to me, in the best way possible. Um, and it, they're very memorable. And I think they add a lot of personality and character to a space that get, that sometimes comes across as very cold, callous, and dead. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, it sucks. I mean, the same goes for you. That's why you've been successful at what you do. And, you know, you got to be okay with being you, with all your flaws, you know, and scars yep. and scabs and stuff. Like, I am who I am. I own the company. I do what I want. And fortunately for most people, I want my employees to have the best careers ever. I want there to be passion from my employees, from me, and and our customers about our product. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I like having fun. And I like doing the marketing the, the way that I do. I, I'm so passionate about marketing and I'm not great at it, but I think the personality side goes a long way. I don't care about being quote unquote professional. Yeah. You know, where I'm professional is my commitment to the product and the program and to the customer service and the customers. You know, I don't have to do it in your way. And I don't give a shit what you think. You know, it's so funny. Like, I get made fun of by, like, all these haters that post things about me skateboarding. Because mm-hmm. I still skate with my kids and all. And I tell you, just two days ago, I had a dude send me a picture of his daughter. She watched a video of me skateboarding and wanted a skateboard. And he went and got her a little one to see if she would like it with pads. And all. send me the picture. Yeah. I fell in love. It made my day. I told him, and I sent it yesterday. You know, send me her name and her, uh, your address. I'm going to build her a board and send it to her like a real skateboard. Yeah. And I made my day and you know, it made me happier than it's even going to make them, but I bet I also have a customer for life. This is true. So I, I, it, it seems marketing seems pretty simple to me and the way that I do it. I just do what I feel. Sometimes I mess up. But I want engagement, and I want there to be a face. With Advanced Armin, I was never the face of the company. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a mistake. Um, you know, not all people like me, but a connection with a company uh, to where it's not just a board of directors. You don't know who it is. That I'm a person. I have kids. I got a family. I do the same stuff you do. And I also love this thing. And yeah, I think you know, I think one of the biggest contradictions from consumers in the gun industry is this notion that – you know, in one breath, they'll say there's no innovation in the industry. They do all do the same things. There's no innovation. But then the moment a company steps up to do something innovative, they, they criticize it and critique it and say, oh, what do you think you're doing? This is stupid. Who needs that? This is so dumb. And it's kind of like, like in a way, we almost create the conditions that we complain about and then complain about anyone trying to change those conditions. <laughs> it's almost yeah, kind of like there's, it, a, it, there's a consumer it, Stockholm syndrome and yeah, the, you're right. <laughs> lack of innovation. Yeah. Um, yeah, the psychology behind it is interesting. And I think that people, um, I see it a lot. I, I think it's partially, you know, you can't teach someone to be creative. I don't think you're like, you just either you are, or you aren't. And so it takes people time to absorb some of that. But then I think from an industry standpoint, there's not a lot of new stuff. And so 
you get a lot of criticism from industry because they're jealous or they're unable to do what you do or they know they're going to follow you forever. Gotcha. You know, it's like Dead Air is a good silencer company. I like them. I like Mike Pappas. I think the owner is a total dirtbag. But <laughs> all they do is copy us now. They make good products now. And I, I guarantee you by the end of the year or by next year, they'll have even copied our cherry bomb and our mounting system. And one way is it's aggravating. And then another way, it's like really great. Like you are stuck behind me forever now. Like that's what you're doing. You're chasing me. And it legitimizes our design, our engineering. Every time these companies copy us, when they all go to tubeless silencers, circumferential, you know, welded, like we developed that process at advanced armament and everybody copies it now. Uh, everybody's copying the mounting system, the little Erector 22 silencer. Everybody copies that. The first two years, everybody mocked it. Yeah. Um, and and so sometimes, but I don't get super hung up on the money. You know, it's not why I still work, and it's not what I like as much. Now, as I'm, I'm going to pause you for a second because I know yeah. there are going to be a lot of people right now who hear you say that, and they're going to be like, bullshit. And I, I, I will go on a line and say I, I've, been, I've been around on you long enough that I picked up on that, and I, and I, I do believe you when you say that. Um, so just for the people out there listening who are like, nah, he's full of shit. No, I, he, he, I, I can, I can attest to that. No, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, so like I can say anybody in the industry that says that our guns aren't worth it or they're not, you know, leading the industry, like they're either ignorant or they're liars. Okay. Speaking of which, I hate, I hate, I hate to just change subject on you real quickly yeah. where you're going, but it just came to my mind. Um, and none other people are going to hate me for this, but the sugar weasel. Can you can you yeah. conceptually? Because I get a lot of questions about that, and, and I have one. I just haven't done a video on it yet. But conceptually, can you explain that to a lot of people? Because I do get a lot of people asking me. They're like, "All right, honey badger or sugar weasel? Which one should I get?" Yada 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 yada. Yeah, I think for most people, it's probably the sugar weasel. Here's the thing: why we did it, we couldn't produce enough of the honey badgers. The honey badger, although it looks just like an AR, mm -hmm. everything about it except for some of the small parts. And the, and the receiver are unique. The, you know, the receivers are billet. The stock assembly is totally obviously custom and for the honey badger. And it's very expensive. Um, but the real heart of the gun is the barrel, the tapered muzzle, the one in five twist, and it being lightweight. So we were able to, and what we wanted to do is to reach a price point to where, you know, guys getting right out of college or could afford one um you know where the the honey badger is an expensive gun i don't know it's probably like twenty five hundred dollars yeah. a lot a lot of money to me um so we wanted to to be able to take a thousand bucks out of that and offer the the real honest benefits for 99 percent of the cases of the honey badger so it has forged upper and lower receivers that cut hundreds of dollars of my cost out and then we cut out the honey badger stock and we did clear coat you know just a standard m4 uh, receiver extension and the SB tactical brace on it. And we're still able to get the gun within a couple ounces of the honey badger, which makes it generally about one and a half, two pounds lighter than the rest of the industry. Yeah. And you get the fast twist barrel. So you get energy with supersonics and you get the accuracy with the subsonics. You still get our adjustable gas block. You still get the honey badger hand guard. And it looks like the honey badger for the colors. And th that was the whole reason to do it. And we're able to produce a lot more of those than we are the honey badger. Gotcha. So I, I don't know the answer. If you love the honey badger and call of duty, um, that get the honey badger. If, if you need it to be as compact as possible, those two or three inches with the honey badger short receiver extension um, are important to you. Get that gun. So um, uh, personally, because I have both, I have uh, mm -hmm. the honey badger. I I generally will that that would be relegated to kind of like home defense aspects because i have like you know i live in a town so i tend to have a rifle on each level yeah the sugar weasel is i fit it with a law tactical folder um i still need to run kind of really run it to see how it functions but i plan on making that a a, sort of a backpack gun of sorts because i can fold it um yeah. and allow it to get as small as possible um so, so that's just kind of my typical approach to it um and I, I, I'm, I'm actually a fan of the, sh I'm a fan of the sugar weasel and a fan of the honey badger, but for two, for very different reasons, ironically enough. Hmm. Yeah, I have them both and I, I like them both. Um, you know, I, I don't, you know, if you don't like the honey badger stock or something, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. 
but we just created a, a demand and the company grew and got way more popular faster than we were thinking. I mean, you think, like I said it earlier, we're only four years old. Yeah. Like th- there's no one in the industry doesn't know who we are. <laughs> um, y- you know, and still, and whether it be the silencers or the guns. Um, so that was just, and I thought it was a risk because I didn't want to just do a standard AR and devalue the company because I'm trying to build a brand and brand equity. And, yeah. you know, like you love H and K, I love H and K and H and K, you know, like when you were born and 10 years after that was just the most incredible company. Yeah. They had so much influence over me and wanting to be in the industry and starting a company and, uh, that, I love H and K and that is the first time I really saw brand equity that I would like that meant, okay, you buy something H and K it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be the shit. It's going to be so nice. So good. The engineering, like very inspiring to me. I love H and K. Um, and that's what I want to build. So I was worried about doing the sugar wizard because I thought, well, shit, maybe it's just an AR. People won't accept it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's still like relatively expensive for some things you can get. And, you, you know, but you do get the benefit. Like I said, the tapered muzzle, adjustable gas block, uh, the one in five twist barrel, the super lightweight. And it's a good value, even though it's expensive. But then it, it really took off. I mean, I think we've got a six to eight month back order on that gun right now. Yeah. No, I mean, I, th- I look, I look at the, I look at the honey badger. If I were to put it in car perspective, you look at, yeah. you look at Porsche, Porsche, for instance. Um, in many yeah. ways, actually, I like, I like in Porsche to HK in the way they kind of approach things. But um, I agree. You take the Carrera S, yeah, and then you take the 911 GT3, and you look at them to the undiscerning guy. It's like they look like the same damn car. It's like why would I pay thirty to forty thousand dollars more for a GT3? when I can just get a career S right. Even on, even on paper, the numbers seem kind of unnecessary, like, uh, like really similar in a lot of ways. But that is until you drive the two cars. They're two totally different cars. Um, yeah. And you know, same thing with, with, with the honey badger and say you're an, another, another AR that is, that also shoots the same round that has the same link barrel. And, and you look at it and you say, well, why would I pay this much for the honey badger? It is one of those things that you have to experience. There are a lot of intangibles that come with going with one particular option or the other. Isn't that one's bad or the other one's worse? It's where do you place your value? So for me, exactly. with, yeah, with the honey badger, there's, there are a lot of intangibles. One of the things, for instance, for me was how light it was. And I think it's a little unfair for me to say this because I've actually had the ability to take the honey badger out, go and use it, i.e. going out yeah. on a hog hunt, you know what I mean? And then being able to shoot mm-hmm. it extensively. So I was able yeah. to kind of pick up those intangibles in a way that it's kind of hard to really ascertain through a video or through pictures and things of that. And they were even looking at a stat sheet. Um, you kind yeah. of really have to, if you can, just be able to get your hands on it. <laughs> That's the, only, yeah. the best way I can put it because it's like, I, I agree completely. You know. Um, you know, I look at it as the GT three. I mean, it yeah. is like, it is just, it's the race car. Yeah. It is everything we could do. And everything was designed with the guys that were actually going to use it and stake their lives on it. Um, yeah. And the sugar weasel, you're right. It's a step down. It's just like the, the standard 911. I, I, no, um, I put the sugar weasel in in the in the G, uh, GTS. Uh, okay. that, the sugar weasel to me is the GTS um, because it's 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 essentially in many ways the honey badger. But They're, you're not trying to be flashy with. Exactly. Yeah, that's probably a great analogy. Yeah, yeah, because it does give you like so many benefits over. Um, you know, like I saw Daniel Defense this year did a, a honey badger copy, mm-hmm. and the gun weighs like <laughs> six and a half pounds something ridiculous so okay they it gained one and a half two pounds and they're using like a one in seven or a one in eight twist short barrel mm-hmm. and it's just everything they did is wrong and you know i would pay because i actually shoot things um you know i would pay five hundred dollars for the fast twist barrel you know then the adjustable gas block the tapered muzzle because we talked about the thunder chicken and the trash pan those are our kind of muzzle attachment yeah. you know they attach to their muzzle device silencers but our silencers, our thread mount silencers, go on any barrel. But they also have a taper for our tapered muzzle. And the original Honey Badger at Advanced Armament had the tapered muzzle with a thread mount silencer. It was the first machine gun 
not to need a fast attach silencer. Like you eliminate that part, you eliminate that size and weight, like all those great things. Um, so, so, you know, even taking a standard AR and not everybody needs, like a lot of people just need a station wagon. They don't even need a 911, much less like GTS or GT3 or whatever. See, now, and that's okay. And that's kind of where I think, because for instance, like I have, I have the Daniel Defense um, and, and I liked it in the, in, the, in the space that it was in. And so I think there is, I think a lot of people do tend to forget that too. It's like, what are you looking for? What do you, what do you want? Right. Um, like you said, yeah. some people, some people are like, nope. I want like for instance, I test drove, um, I test drove the 911 GT. Uh, I test drove the Porsche, uh, the 2014 to uh, damn it, what's wrong with me? A 2014 911 Porsche Turbo S, and and then I awesome test drove a 2000 exactly. I test drove a 2013 Carrera S, and then I also test drove a 2014 GT3, and you know, I, I the turbo for me it just didn't. You know, I was talking, I was actually talking, having a conversation on the phone with uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Adrian from Salient. And we, we, we were talking, he's a big Porsche guy. And we were yeah. talking about it and he was just like, you know, you, because I was trying to tell him, I was like, man, this Carrera S is the bomb. Like, I was like, I didn't realize it was, but it's freaking awesome. And it's like half the price of any GT3 that I'd be looking at. And, and he was like, he's like, it is, it's an amazing car, but he's like, you're going to get the GT3. He's like, if you decide to get a car, you're going to get the G3. I was like, why? And he goes, well, if they were the same price, which one would you get? And so uh, you know, like, he like, can always make more money, but man, you can't, you know. <laughs> but and, and the, the, the good point is, it's like people want what they want. So right now, I'm limited by my money. So my question, so then yeah. I have to determine, okay, do I just pay for something that I kind of want, or do I wait to see if I can get something that I really want? Sometimes it makes sense to just get the thing that you can get now, especially when you're talking about a I agree. stance. Yeah, you know? um, like if I don't have a gun at all and it's like I want to get my first gun, I would love to have a honey badger, but I really can't swing that price. Um, yeah. So if in the meantime, you say you get, for instance, a Daniel Defense PDW, great. Um, but in the meantime, you know, for me, I always kind of look at things in that manner. It's like, okay, well, how much am I willing to sacrifice to get the thing that I really want? Or sometimes it is just okay to get the thing that you kind of want. You'll, you'll like it, but it's not your ideal. Um, yeah, I agree. And I think for most people, they're either safe queens or it's what they can afford or they want to show their friends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just try to build and design everything and pick projects to, I want to be the best. Yeah. And I don't, it, with my job, you, you know, but, but I also, you know, I wear t-shirt and shorts every day. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, but with this one thing, like I only have, my career is very fulfilling to me and, um, I want to be the best at it. And where I've found my niche is doing this thing. I agree. And when people ask me, like, I like that there's other silencer companies and there's cheaper ones, yeah. like trying to make a bad choice. And then also like the Springfield Saint, like the, and they came out with like a honey badger style gun this year. Mm -hmm. And that's great. Like, Okay, get their eight hundred dollar gun, shoot some three hundred blackout, get you a silencer, and then realize how wonderful that is, and that changes your life. And then you're going to start wanting to get a better and better gun. And okay, what's fast twist barrel going to do for me? Mm -hmm. What's a better trigger going to do? Um, yeah, it's I, I like it, and I think with the back order situation that we've had, combined with the the growth of production that that we've done. Um, I'm happy with where we are, but it's interesting. I get like a call or a message every day. So I'd be like, I really want a honey badger, but I don't like the colors. And I'm like, that's super cool. And I appreciate the support, <laughs> but you can either paint it when you get it or you buy someone else's that's gun. Good. Yeah. It's like, we, we didn't make the gun like 20 colors of gold and gray to, to like to just... stand out. Like the idea is it's absolutely the best finish for what we needed to do. Mm -hmm. And that the guys that were actually going to adopt it are going to paint the gun anyway, like some kind of weird camo. So mm -hmm. like th this was the best decision. Well, if we squirt, you know, a pigment into the solution when they're anodizing it, it's making your finish worse just to give you a color. Like <laughs> that makes no sense to me. And I guess like the GT3, it's like, I don't know. Some people don't want to drive that car every day. They want the cushier one. Yeah. And that, that's totally acceptable. But the, the GT3 ain't dying. No, nah, it's not. No. Not at all. And it's, so, yeah. And the funny thing is, ironically enough, 
You know, I remember like when I was test driving the car, the guy who was with me, which pissed me off because I hate when the salesman actually get in the car with me when I test drive it. Um, yeah. And I knew damn well I wasn't buying anything that day. So I'm one of those guys. But, you know, he was like, man, this thing. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm looking at this and possibly like in an older GT3. And he's like, he's like, oh, this will smash the GT3. And in my head, I was like, shut up. You don't even know what you're looking <laughs> for in a car. <laughs> like, you know, he's like, it's so much faster. And I'm like, I'm not here to buy the fastest car in the world. I will take sensation of speed over actual speed any day for the most part. Once you hit a certain threshold, that's when you start kind of fine tuning the, 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 the kind of particular aspects of what you're looking for. So like with me, I, I like I don't I, I live in a city like I'm, and I and I don't need a car that's going to do zero to 60 in point two seconds, honestly, for me, because I know what kind of trouble I'm going to get into. So yeah. I need a car that's fast enough that it, t- it tickles my fancy, but then gives me all the sensorial sensations I need that what the GT3 does. The 911 Turbo just did not do that for me. It was almost too soft. Um, yeah, yeah. if you've driven cars and you've had nice cars, you get it. Yeah. You know, I remember when I was living in the city, when I was living in Atlanta, and I had a, a, I bought a new Gallardo at the time, a Lamborghini. Uh-huh. And I took it in for the service, and I went over by like 3,000 miles. <laughs> took it in like 5,000 miles. <laughs> And, and to me, like, I buy the cars, I have them for a time, get rid of them, get another one yeah. le- later on. I feel like, but, like, when I get one, I drive it in the snow, the rain, yeah. I don't care. Like, it's getting driven. Yep. And I took it in, and the guy, the service guy, you ever hear me tell this story? Like, no. he came from, this, this is like the time when I met young Jesus. But <laughs> it, it, we're the, so he comes out, and he, he's a head service guy, and he wanted to know who's, whose car it was. I told him it's mine. And, uh, I was like, oh man, they're going to say something's wrong. It's like 10 grand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he says, uh, he says, let me ask you how, you know, and then I thought he was going to chastise me for like waiting 5,000 miles instead of 2,500 or whatever for the first service. Yeah. And he's like, uh, how fast have you had that car? I was like, man, I don't know. And, uh, he says in all my years of doing this, I've never had someone put that many miles on a car and the car's never been over 120 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he just thought it was stupid. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember when I went 120. It was on the on-ramp on the highway. <laughs> and he's like, why did you buy this car? And I was like, well, I like going like 40 to 90. Yeah. <laughs> and the car's cool. But same thing. I live in the city. Yeah. Like, I ain't going to go 160 miles an hour in the city. Not a, head, and, not a chance in hell. But I'm he not, just thought, not going to say I've never done it, but. <laughs> but he thought he thought it was ridiculous and i'm like you don't get to decide why i want this car <laughs> whatever um no I, I i'm i'm the same way as you i remember the first i remember when i was going to prom in high school and my mom's boyfriend at the time he had a he had a mercedes e-class um and you know he had just gotten it not too long ago and i i worked up the i worked up the, the actually no i don't think i asked him i think he just offered it and my mom was like, yeah. "Why are you giving him the car?" He's like, "That's she's like, he's like, that's what the car's for is to be driven." And he, and he was like, yeah. I, "He's like, I drive my cars." And ever since I heard him say that, I've always been that way. Um, that's and, so cool. You know, and so, yeah, that, that, I really didn't get two shits about the prom. I re- if I could have just <laughs> driven the car the whole time, I would have been <laughs> just fine. Like I, don't, like I barely remember who I went to the prom with. Actually, I do remember, but yeah, um, yeah I remember. I was like, I just want to drive the car. I don't give two shits. Just want to drive the your car, guy. Yep. You know, for me, well, I, I view that with guns, too. Yeah. Um, you know, our guns, uh, when people say Gucci, and I think maybe I'm too old, like, I kind of take it as derogatory. Like, they mean you're buying it because it's fancy, not because it's the best. But uh, Yeah, I think there, I, I think it has a duality of purpose. I, I, I think yeah. I, I embrace it because I don't, I'm, I'm unapologetically into Gucci guns. I love yeah, practicality yeah, guns, are. but I am unapologetically into Gucci guns. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, for, well for, no, it's, it's fine. But I get it. But for me... It's like our guns are to be used. Like it's the same thing. A lot of custom knife makers they give me knives, and some of them are worth you know a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And it was cool about the whole knife thing, which I'm not super into, but you know, like I have knives. Yeah. Um, is if one of those guys gives you a knife and it's like a twelve hundred dollar pocket knife, which seems crazy to me, but I understand like it's craftsmanship. Dude's you know you just bought a week of his life. They give me one, and then I'm always like, oh, it's so. But they don't like if you don't use them. <laughs> and and i love that about those guys yeah. and i think it's the same way with our stuff like we build everything to be used and used hard like we don't build anything to be fancy or to be cool 
it just turns out that it is cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's the way I like it. No, I'm 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 I love that. Like I love that because even my Gucci guns, I, I shoot the hell out of them. Yeah, it's just a stupid gun. <laughs> shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, guns are cool, like cars and motorcycles and stuff, where there's an aesthetic appeal, kind of like you know, with your woman or whatever. Yeah. And the bad thing, and that's what's so cool about like Galatech or whoever that company is that makes that stuff where you can hang your guns up. Yep. People are getting into it now yeah. because. You know, most of my life owning guns and having a big gun collection and machine guns, you have to keep them in a safe. You don't get yep. to appreciate that part of them. Um, no, and that, it's funny you say that because I like I have I have that system, um, and so I'm like, my whole thing was, and I have saves, but the saves really yeah. are really more so for storage. I yeah. that turn. I make sure I try to turn my entire house into a safe, as far as security yeah. standpoint, so that I can display my guns. Um, yeah, you know, and not have to worry about it. Um, but yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Like I like, I spend just as much time looking and admiring at my, my guns as I do shooting them. So I want to be able to do that as much as possible yeah. when I'm at home. It's important, you know, aesthetics, no matter what people say, yep. you know, Ferrari doesn't build ugly cars on purpose, man. <laughs> and, and I think with guns too, like I, I, you know, love art and design stuff, as you know, and, uh, you know, the marketing creative side, Yeah, like I'm, I'm a generally a pretty creative guy. And I love for our guns to look beautiful, yep. but I don't do it to, I won't do it to sacrifice things that are important feature wise. Yeah. You, you know, we, everything is packed full of feature, but at the end, when I can do subtleties of making the guns look cool, you know, it's kind of like the fix kind of looks like an AK to some degree and stuff. Mm-hmm. Cause I love the AK and it's beautiful and it's iconic and it has good lines. And I draw from that. I drew from my, both my Lamborghinis, or, um, you know, Porsche, like I design, you know, there's lots of great wheels out there, but I always try. And I, I think people a lot of times don't realize it because I know there's most of our mechanical engineers can't really recognize good design mm-hmm. from uh, an aesthetic standpoint or industrial design. And I really like that. And I think it makes a difference. It makes a and I think difference. it's a, yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize it though, but even with guns, um, you know, it's like, I love Glocks, but. I really love the way H and K's look. Yeah, and that's you know? what people don't understand. Like it's like that's like, and then the thing is if that makes it easier to love the H K guns. Is, I mean, you know they work. <laughs> so yeah, it's like, we've gotten that you out know, of the way. Now let's talk about how sexy this damn thing looks. Um, and I love Glock the because they're inexpensive, and I know they're going to work. But H and K's work too, and man, they look so good. Yeah. And and you know, it doesn't take if you put a little thought in ahead of time and design with the gun. I think it can make a big difference and it makes it iconic. Like when I see the honey badger in the fix now, mm-hmm. and it's not because I was involved with it uh, or, you know, it's my company. They pop out to me in the gun store and I love them. I hate ugly guns. I hate ugly cars. I hate ugly shoes. You know, shit doesn't have to be ugly. No, it really but, doesn't. Uh, it really spend does. the time, spend the time to do both. And, and you know, you- I don't go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, unfortunately, like industrial stuff kind of looks cool, too, because we're not adding weight or stuff to the gun to make it look good. But, mm-hmm. you know, just with the lines, the guns and, you know, a st- like with the fix, me adding a touch of blue or doing different things like that to it. And it's just all aesthetic things that I like and I want us to be different and I want things to look the way I want them to. Gotcha. Would you consider yourself a boutique brand? Huh. Yeah, pr- probably, maybe. I do. I mean, we're 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 gro- <laughs> we're growing a lot, but I think boutique and the idea of service and super high quality. The company's growing. I mean, Q is going to be a very big gun company. Mm-hmm. Um, now, keep in mind, I didn't mean boutique in terms of size. That's not when I when I was saying boutique. Oh, you talking about mean, you just being small, a smaller company. It just the I look at when I say boutique, I think a feel. Yeah, There's a kind of more, a more personalized feel, even though. You know, there, there is a, there is a consistency with all the products, but there's an aspect to it. There's a more personality and a, a feel to the brand that you normally wouldn't get from some other places. Yeah, I think that's fair, and I always want it to be that way. Like to me, um, I when it gets too big and we can't do that, mm-hmm. you know, the way I'm able to do it now, you know, I'll probably become much less interested. Gotcha. Like, like th- that's part of what I love. I want the connection with the customers. I want us to, uh, I like that perception. I like the company behaving that way. I like the personality that we have. 
um, you know, and at some point, you know, you're growing or dying. And so at some point it gets too big to really manage that probably the way we do now. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be really heartbreaking for me. I know in some ways this is the hardest part of having a company. Well, probably not because we're in our fourth year now. So we're past like the first three, which is very difficult. Yeah. Um, but the difficulties that we have now, you know, growing production, all these other things that are kind of a pain in the ass, you know, and I've stepped back actually now and we've got a new CEO um, you know, I'm chairman of the board, like I said earlier, and uh, innovation and marketing officer, because mm. those are the things I'm really good at. I feel like I can help the company most with. Yeah. And we're to the point now we have to grow so much that we have real operations people in place, which is great. And that's one milestone that we're reaching that's exciting. But I also know, you know, I don't mind giving up control and things. Um, but but I know, you know, with the next milestone and the next it's very difficult, and that's why I want my job to be focused on ensuring we can maintain that personality and fun and culture as long as possible. Because I think that kind of excitement and inspiration is what gets my guys uh, and our team, you know, design, engineer, assembly, everybody to love the company. And, you know, they do a better job, and everybody ends up getting a better product in the end. And that's what's exciting to me. Yep. So, you know, like I know this is a great time for the company, even though it's like aggravating for some people that haven't been there before, because uh -huh. I just think, oh, well, when we've got 500 employees and all, it's we're not going to be able to, you know, drink beer on Friday and have, you know, ping pong tournaments and stuff. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's depressing to me that that's coming one day, you know? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I totally get it, man. Um, you know, it's 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 one of those things where it's like maintaining the passion for something you do and scaling always come with a cost oh yeah yeah it's, it's just it's just it's just one of those things and i think a lot of people don't realize that you know like i'd love to be able to sit and work on a gun review video for a month <laughs> yeah but it just it just doesn't make sense i'd love to to spend a month yep. making it beautiful and just saying the exact perfect word or turn of phrase that i want i'd love to sit on a video and spend two three weeks doing that but yeah but there's only two percent of us that would give a shit exactly. <laughs> you know, everybody else exactly. they just want the information pretty much yep, yep. yeah yep. Yep. but but yeah man it's it's a uh, oh boy we've yeah, we, we've, we've really dived into it um but I mean, I really appreciate it, man. Uh, uh, you know, taking the time to kind of talk us through some of the things because I know a lot of the questions I asked you, I was asking from a standpoint of other people who have asked me these questions as well, and some of them were questions of my own. And um, and I, I think you you really kind of pulled the, pulled the curtain back on a lot of misinformation regarding silencers, three inch blackouts, so forth and so on. And um, oh, great. You know, and so I look forward to, uh, you know, I, I do need to get that, that sugar weasel video done so that people can stop asking me questions about it. Yeah, get off your butt, man. Go do some work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate uh, so much and so good catching up with you and talking about those things. And I'm always available if you run into questions like that or you need anything. Absolutely. No, no, we're definitely going to have you back on. Definitely. All right. Well, I look forward to us going on another hunt or hanging out, yes, talking sir. about girls or whatever. Absolutely. Looking forward to it, brother. All right, buddy. All right. Right now, there's a war against the Second Amendment, which is why I need your help spreading our message to counter their message. You can help do this by leaving a comment, sharing this video, and clicking the bell and subscribe button. Let my voice be your voice, and let them know you want to keep America tactical, because the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed wasn't a suggestion. It was a directive. Also, if you're wondering where to purchase your all guns are essential, I will not comply. I am the militia. I lost all my guns in a boating accident and your state specific Keep America Tactical shirts. Click the link next to my head or the link in the description section. Or if you're watching this on a mobile, tap the small triangle on the lower right hand side of this video and click the link in the description section.